gods, the Greek gods, again, it's kind of their beauty and their cruelty. I mean, they're unbelievably cruel, very glamorous, very cruel. So they have a kind of rock star quality to them. And I just found them much, much more kind of glamorous, that, I suppose, than the, uh, the monotheistic god. Hello and welcome to Confessions. I'm Giles Fraser. This is a podcast where I talk to distinguished and well-known guests and ask them what it is that makes them tick. I'll be trying to drill down into some of their core beliefs to understand a bit better how they are and what they're all about. Bearing his soul to me in the store this week is historian Tom Holland. So if you've tuned in to listen to Tom Holland playing Superman, you'll be sorely mistaken um, because uh, this isn't that Tom Holland I've got with me this morning. It's another superhero who's um, written about sort of everything, really, from the Persians to ancient England to uh, what else, Tom? Rome. Uh, You've written vampire movies, a play. You've translated Herodotus. You've done quite a lot, mate. (laughs) Yeah, jack of all trades, master of none. (laughs) Look, what I wanted to start to talk to you about was um, uh, your fascinating interest and historical uh, investigations into Islam, which has uh, caused some controversy and got you into some hot water in some circles. Yeah, yes. Well, I, I, um, I, I, it was less an interest in Islam, I suppose, than an interest in um, the emergence of the Arab Empire in the seventh century, which, of course coincides or perhaps doesn't coincide with the emergence of Islam. But my my interest in it primarily was as the agent of the fall of the Roman Empire in the East, because um, antiquity was always kind of my first love. And so the Roman Empire and also the Persian Empire, both of which collapse before the invasion of the Arabs in the seventh century, I wanted to know what had happened to them. And the paradigm that I brought to that was the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West, what most people, I guess, living in the West tend to think of as being the fall of the Roman Empire. But of course, it wasn't. It was just a collapse of the Western half, including Rome. But you have Constantinople, the new Rome, you know, survives the, the, the collapse in the fifth century. Absolutely fine. Now, the, the question that historians ask about the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West is whether it was a rupture or whether it was a transformation. And the consensus generally is that you don't have really radical ruptures in history. There's a process of of, of transformation, of evolution. And so in a sense, you can talk about the barbarian kingdoms that emerge um, over the rubble of the, the Roman Western Empire as kind of being successor Roman states, that they... Um, they speak, they speak kind of, you know, Latin continues to be spoken and in due course that will emerge to become Italian and French and Spanish and so on. Uh, of course, they inherit Christianity. They inherit certain structures and assumptions about so this how is the continuity. government should build. Yes, of course, the, 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 there is change, <clears throat> but there is absolutely continuity too. And in particular, I was thinking of... Um, a complex of buildings that was that was constructed at Ravenna, which had been the capital of the Western Roman Empire. It wasn't Rome, it was Ravenna. Um, gets taken over uh, by um, Gothic conquerors. And these Gothic conquerors define themselves as separate from the Catholic Romans by adopting a, a kind of heretical form of Christianity called, called Arianism. And they construct church buildings and imperial monuments that look very similar to Roman monuments. And there was a kind of great domed building that reminded me of the Dome of the Rock, which is the first great Islamic building built on the what what had been the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, you know, the one with this kind of shimmering gold. And it prompted me to wonder whether perhaps the Dome of the Rock was expressive of a similar process of transformation. In other words, whether... The Arab Empire, and by extension Islam, which becomes the kind of the, the the religion of this empire, whether that had owed much to the Roman and the Persian empires that it had conquered, or whether, as the traditional story had it, the 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 Arabs, aka the Muslims, emerge out of the depths of the desert with no real sense of contact with the the Roman and the Persian empires. So that was what prompted me to look at. Um, that story and the the conclusions that I came to, well, it's certainly not me. You know, there's a very very broad range of scholarly opinion that I was drawing on. That's what got me into trouble. So the sort of 
the traditional story, I guess, is that, um, you know, somewhere around 610 or something like that, the angel Gabriel speaks to Muhammad in a cave and that uh, Muhammad uh, converts the, the Arabs to this religion called Islam and driven by Islam, uh, the sort of Arabs uh, go and conquer half the world. Inspired by Islam, yes. 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 So... Um, the reason I had a problem with that is that I, I have a peculiar discipline that was forced on me by the fact that I was writing a narrative history. So I was I was writing the history of the 6th century and the 7th century. And so I needed to explain how the world of, the, of, of, of late antiquity, the world of, of, of Justinian and Khosrow, the great Byzantine and Persian emperors, became the world of Abdul Malik, the great um, caliph who builds the Dome of the Rock. And so to do that, I had to explain uh, in terms that made sense to me what it was that enabled the Arabs to, 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 to pull off these incredible conquests. Now, as you say, the traditional Muslim account of that is dependent on a great miracle in, in, in Muslim minds, the greatest miracle of all, which is the delivery of God's word to his, his final prophet, the seal of the prophets. The proof that the Quran, this, this, this final revelation, is of divine origin, in a sense, is the fact of the circumstances of its delivery, as told by, by Muslims, which is that the cave in, in, in where Muhammad receives his first revelation, supposedly, is in a place called Mecca. And Mecca is very pointedly a long way from any of the great centres of civilization and habitation. It's a very long way from the frontier of, of, of Palestine, the Roman Empire, very long way from Iraq, um, ruled by the Persian emperors. It's a long way from the kingdoms of, of southern Arabia. In a sense, it's as far away from civilization as you can possibly get. And that kind of seems to be the point. It comes Bec out of nowhere. It comes out of nowhere. Because what's happening with that, it seems to me, is that... A case is being presented that its delivery could only be miraculous. And so in a sense, the, the vast expanse of, 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 of sand that surrounds Mecca and encloses it is kind of like the virgin womb of Mary for Christians, because it's incredibly important for Christians when they say the divine has entered the, the diurnal dimension, the, the terrestrial earthly dimension, that Christ be divinely, of divine origin. Because if he's the son of a, a Roman centurion or someone, as, as Talmudic scholars tend to say, then there's a huge problem for the entire Christian faith. Likewise, if the Quran does not come from God, but is a, a collation of different influences, of, of different sources, then of course, that potentially raises issues for, for, for the truth of, of, of Islam as well. Now, if you're a Muslim, your acceptance that the, that the Quran is a revelation of God is at the heart of your faith. But conversely, if you're not a Muslim, you cannot accept that the Quran comes from God because to do so would make you a Muslim and I'm not a Muslim. So therefore, my, 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 my task with the book that I wrote in The Shadow of the Sword, the one that got me into trouble, was to make was, was, was to present um, a case for why and how the Arab Empire and Islam might have emerged that did not depend on supernatural intervention. So uh, were you in trouble in the same way that the quest for the historical Jesus people were in trouble in the 19th century? Yes, I, I, th I think that that's, that's a very close parallel. Um, and there's a sense in which the, um, the, the, the process by which Christian in particular, but then also Jewish scholars kind of operated on the fabric of the Bible like moths, <laughs> you know, <laughs> eating up a, a beautiful robe. It's essentially those methodologies and essentially those kind of historiographical assumptions that are being used by scholars today to look at the origins of the Quran and to look at the foundation myths of Islam. Now, of course, that is... The risk of that is that you, you, you seem Orientalist because there's a sense in which the, although it was incredibly upsetting for Christians to be told that, you know, maybe the Bible wasn't absolutely 100% to be taken literally as history, the people who were saying that were the sons of Lutheran pastors or kind of, you know, um, uh, Catholics who'd lost their faith. Most Muslims 
look at the scholars who are doing this kind of work and say, well, you know, you're not even Muslim. You're not you're even from a Muslim us. background. Yeah. And, and so that, that makes it problematic. I mean, my defense is that I am only applying to the origins of the Arab Empire the kind of methodology that I'd also applied to the origins of the Roman Empire, to the Persian Empire, to Athens, to Sparta. All of the, you know, it, you know or, 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 or let's say England. So, so the foundation myths of England are incredibly similar and they, emer- they both merge opposite ends of the Roman Empire from the same process of implosion. And they both impose a kind of mythic archetype which essentially derives from the book of Exodus. So it's purity of origins, which is which is important to establish. And uh, I mean, in, in, you talk about Exodus, and I mean, I met, when when historians work on Moses and and the Exodus story, there's a similar sort of scepticism about the historical. Well, a much greater one because because the evidence for Exodus is is almost minimal. Um, I mean, many would say it's absolutely minimal. But the, as a as as a kind of myth, it's obviously incredibly potent, and this sense that. God has chosen the people that you belong to to be a chosen people and has given them a land was obviously incredibly useful in the process of convulsion and transformation that that, that followed the collapse of the Roman Empire. And so Bede, writing in England, is able to construct a, a notion of a people that he calls Angli, which ultimately will become the English. And he, he fashions this identity out of a number of different peoples, different kingdoms, puts them together, gives them this kind of mythic sense of themselves. Now, of course, what Bede can't do is what the Muslim historians are able to do, which is to give them a direct biblical role. The Arabs are unique among the various peoples who established successor states amid what had been the Roman Empire in that they have potentially a link to the book of Genesis itself because Abraham has two sons. He has Isaac from which the Jews are descended, but he also has another son by um, a concubine called Hagar. He's called Ishmael. And traditionally, Jews and Christians had identified the descendants of Ishmael, the Ishmaelites, with the Arabs. And we know that well before Muhammad, this was a notion of themselves that Arabs living along the borders of the Roman and Persian empires, often within the limits of the Persian and Roman empires, had adopted. So they had a sense of themselves as a chosen people. And So and, before, and, the, before Muhammad, what religion were the Arabs? Well, it, it depends what you mean by the Arabs, okay. because again, the, the, the notion of a single Arab people is kind of an invention of the Quran, and it, it then gets imposed on... Um, on, on the empire, and so the the, the notion of of what is an Arab so is very unsafe. Arab... But let's say people calling speaking forms of Arabic, well, it generally they are Christian along the borders of um, uh, of, uh, of of the Roman Empire. They seem to have Trinitarian, probably right. Yeah, okay. probably. Um, others seem to have worshipped um, a, a kind of single god who presides over a kind of pantheon of lesser gods. Um, it's clear that they worship um, gods that are that are named in 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 the Quran. So that seems to be kind of some evidence that that's the milieu it's coming from. But what I, I don't think you have really anywhere is this notion that is fostered by um, much later Muslim traditions of a, a, a total paganism that is untouched by any Jewish or Christian influences whatsoever. And the crucial evidence for that is actually the Quran itself, because according to traditional accounts, the Quran is um, is delivered to Muhammad in a totally pagan city, Mecca. And the Meccans know nothing of, of Judaism or Christianity. But it's evident when you read the Quran that actually this is not a debate between um, a, mono, a, 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 a Judeo-Christian monotheist, a, a, a monotheist from that biblical tradition, and pagans. It's an argument between two groups of people, both of whom absolutely are familiar with those biblical traditions. Because at nowhere is there any is there, is, is it felt that there's any need for let the prophet, let's call him Muhammad, to explain who Ibrahim or Noah or Jesus are. It's taken for so granted. It's, assumed, it's just assumed that they exist. And essentially, the, the, the <clears throat> core of the debate, there seems to be an, a debate about the role and the nature of angels. So as, as a historian, let's just do this simply. So as a historian, the, the, the story about um, uh, Muhammad receiving 
uh, the Quran through through um, Gabriel, and then you, you know the, the success of that, uh, converting converting the Arabs, and then uh, conquering the world. It what 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 about that particular story, which millions of people adhere to? Well, very passionately. As a, when you approach that as a historian, what problems do you find with that? Well, the the the, the problem is that. Um, the story is so well known and it's so embedded and everything that, that that any Muslim scholar has ever written over the entire course of Islamic history has essentially gone towards supporting and buttressing that story. That to act on the assumption that, that, that it may not be historiographically true is immediately problematic because really the Islamic account is the only story that we really have in detail about how Islam came into being. Now, that's not entirely true because there are sources contemporaneous sources, sources written in the decades and then the century that followed um, what seems to have been the lifetime of Muhammad that do give, I mean, for instance, it, it makes it clear that someone called Muhammad did exist. It makes it clear that he he, he did preach a kind of form of uh, an Ishmaelite notion that the Arabs had a stake on on um, on the Holy Land, which is the first target of the Arab invasions. I mean, in the history, you know, even the, the, the traditional account makes that absolutely clear. Um, but essentially, you have to do what any historian does which is always to go back to the earliest possible sources that you can and then try to place those sources in the, in, in the broader context. And the broad context of the emergence of the Arab Empire is a series of crises that had buffeted um, the world of the ancient empires in, in a completely devastating way. So there'd been a plague equivalent of the Black Death. It, it was literally bubonic plague. It's possible that... Um, you know, in places up to half the population were wiped out. And of course, it particularly hit urban areas, which was devastating for empires that depended on manpower for armies and for, for, for their tax base. Um, and then there's a completely devastating war, which lasts a generation and more between the two great superpowers, Persia and, and, and Rome. And although the Romans kind of win that... And yeah. they're able to they're reclaim their provinces. They? Yeah, the, 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 you know, the closest modern parallel would probably be with the French moving into Vietnam after the Second World War. You know, they'd suffered humiliation, humiliations and defeat. The people they'd been ruling had seen them defeated. They come back in after a nominal victory. But essentially, their power is shot. And I think that um, what happens then is that... They'd been employing Arabs to serve them as their mercenaries because the Arabs lying beyond the desert, of course, are much less affected by plague. Um, during the period of Persian rule, those Arab kingdoms, those Arab mercenaries are not being paid. So what are they doing? Perhaps they're in the market for, you know, a new sense of themselves, which perhaps Muhammad's teachings are providing. Some of them may have kind of gone over to, 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 to the notion of themselves as an Ishmaelite people who were owed the rule of the whole of the Holy Land. Others clearly stayed loyal to the Roman Empire. And there seems basically to have been a kind of war between various Arab factions over who should rule Syria and Palestine. So in fact, far from it having been a, a mass invasion of, you know, people with Quran in the one hand and sword in the other, it seems to me that actually the collapse of, of Roman power in Syria and, 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 and Palestine was probably collateral damage inflicted by a war between rival factions of Arabs. And the same thing happens in Mesopotamia, where the Persians likewise have been completely devastated and, 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 are, and are exhausted. And within the space of a decade, the Arabs find themselves ruling the Fertile Crescent, the whole of the Fertile Crescent. And, you know, nothing like this had ever happened before in the entire recorded history of civilization. The Arabs had always, people of the desert had always lurked beyond the borders. And now they find themselves ruling this, this kind of ancient heartland of civilization. And they have the wealth and they have the power and they have the resources to start expanding. So they move eastwards into Iran and they move westwards into Egypt and then you know further ancient civilizations have become theirs and nothing ever happens in late antiquity that is not explained by God and so this is a convulsion this is a, you know a, 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 a winnowing of the nations of an order that would indeed prompt the notion that some great new divine dispensation has been delivered and so you can see how and why people might have started thinking that yeah, you know, something so really radical. So it's a really retrospective has... sort of explanation. I think so. Uh, th th there's, there's, there's very, you know, there's no mention of Muhammad at all on any public inscription until basically site six ninety. So that's kind of essentially um, six decades after he's supposed to have died. 
Um, and what evidence we have for the cult of Muhammad as a prophet being promoted, it seems to have been a, a top-down one, and it seems to have been launched by this guy, Abdul Malik, the builder of um, the Dome, Dome of the Rock, of the Rock yes. who essentially is Islam's Saint Paul and Constantine rolled into one. He is he he is he he's a victor in a civil war in which his rival also has tried to claim an authority via Muhammad. And you can see why if you you know you're trying to recruit the loyalty of people, you might want to say, well, I have you know this prophet of God on my side. Abdul Malik wins. He he builds the Dome of the Rock not in Mecca not in Medina. He builds it in Jerusalem because Jerusalem at this point is clearly the holy city for the, for, for the Ishmaelites, for the Arabs, whatever you want to call them, as it is for Jews and Christians. And he builds it as, an, as a statement that his faith has superseded that of the Christians and the Jews. And of course, this is aimed both at the, the Jews and Christians who are under his rule, but also very pointedly at the emperor in Constantinople, who is a Christian. And he's saying, this is... You know, I am the favourite, and, and Abdul Malik, you know, he's calling himself the caliph. That, he, that 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 means that he's the deputy of God. It doesn't at this point mean successor of God. It means the deputy of God, and so he is casting himself as a figure who is absolutely on a par with Muhammad, and he's giving himself a sacral authority that can balance out his military control. So you've been speaking as a historian um, now, and of course that's your profession. So quite right. Um, but um, I, I watched last night your uh, your Islam um, film again, and there's a really interesting bit where we, you're with some Bedouin in the desert, and they're encouraging you to pray and things like yeah. that. But you're looking slightly uncomfortable. Yeah, doing. I, but hang on, hang on. The quest, the question is, um, and one of the things that you talk about, and I think it's fascinating, is that you know when the Bedouin are explaining what it is they believe, and they draw upon oral tradition and give this oral tradition, whether they see it as oral tradition or not, this sort of like extremely high status. And you as a historian from a Western tradition, but the, the, a sort of like adjacent to this in a very uncomfortable way. Yeah. Um, well, we'd, we'd, we'd been with them for quite a while and, and they'd been incredibly generous and they'd spoken about... Um, their understanding of what Islam was and who Muhammad had been and their relationship with God in a, 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 an incredibly direct and powerful way, absolutely unmeted to be aided by any sense of the embarrassment that perhaps you know you, you, you would get in, in, in a Western country. And you know I, I was very grateful to them and then very touched when they asked, would I like to join them in prayer? Because they, I guess they thought that I was a searcher. Um, which I was in a sense, but perhaps not in the sense that they'd understood. So I went and asked the, the director, oh, God, they want me to go and pray. And he rubbed his hands and almost cackled with glee <laughs> at the thought of, because he could see, immediately see that this was going to be... There's a point where you do, the sort of, you, do, you, do, you do the sort of prayer that people who come to church yes. and don't really want to pray, <laughs> yes. sort of like, you don't get down fully. No, you sort I of get like, half. Ha, ha, you know, get halfway down. It was down. a very awkward compromise. <laughs> and you I, look so English. Tom, it's spectacular. But it wasn't just that I was English. I mean, there was certainly There's a kind a of element of English embarrassment, but it was more the kind of the embarrassment of the secular meeting, you know, people of profound faith. Yes. And being made to feel uncomfortable by it. Yes, yes, yes. I, you know, yes, there's yes. no question of it. And I felt that, that vis you know, it worked visually because it absolutely summed up Told that story. the difficulty that, that, that anyone writing about beliefs that are deeply held always faces because because um and that you can see how that has a sort of that's quite problematic when those two things meet well i suppose i suppose um you know, it, it, fraser was was um essentially his target was christianity yes. uh, i mean he was going through every conceivable culture that he could think of and trying to find parallels to the resurrection so that he could then prove that this was a kind of cultural archetype and therefore it was all you know much for muchness yes so there was a kind of, um, I, I suppose, a kind of secular supremacism about that. You know, he, he, was, he was ideologically driven. I, I think in my case, it's slightly different because um, one of the effects of writing about uh, late antiquity and particularly Islam 
was to make me realize that actually culturally I'm incredibly Christian and that the methodology that I was bringing, as I said earlier, was actually a very Christian one. And, you know, I, as a 12 year old who was, you know, I, I had a Christian upbringing. I was really very interested in the Bible and biblical history. And I rem- vividly remember the shock of reading, you know, the Bible, the archaeology of the Bible and discovering that actually the archaeology of the Bible didn't really tell you anything about the Bible at all, except that the Bible was unlikely to be historically true. And I remember the shock of that very vividly. And I remember the shock of reading, you know, the deconstructions of the New Testament and the life of Jesus and everything, and the kind of the the, the stab of pain that it gave me. So at, at no point did I ever kind of cackle with glee at the thought, well, I'm, you know, I'm trampling on people's beliefs here. Uh, and I, I hope that... Um, Neither in um, neither in the book that I wrote nor the film that I made that I gave that impression. And in fact, very pointedly, at the end of the film, I go to Sinai, to um, the monastery of uh, of Saint Catherine, and I go there to interrogate my own assumptions and my own traditions and my own background because um, I think that uh, in a way you have a responsibility to be true to your own beliefs. You shouldn't try and moderate your own beliefs because you're afraid of how other people may react. But you should acknowledge that and try and do it in a spirit of mutual respect. So let's start... uh, uh, Let's let's, let's start from some of that early stuff with Tom Holland, because I've heard you um, say uh, that when you were much younger, the sort of first gods that you were interested in that were sexy and more glamorous than all the other gods, as it were, were the Roman gods or the Greek gods. These were the gods. Greek gods, the Greek gods. Was it the Greek gods? Yeah. Okay. Because they were very sexy. I yeah. Mean, you know, but... and, and is that what is that, is that one of the things that uh, got you into the ancient world? Well, even before the Greek gods, there were dinosaurs. And I was one of those small children who, who was obsessed by dinosaurs. And the reason I was obsessed by dinosaurs was because the, the, the world of the Mesozoic seemed infinitely more glamorous. You know, Triceratops seemed much more interesting than kind of cows. And, <laughs> and Tyrannosaurus seemed a lot more interesting than dogs. Yes. And it was the colour. It was the colour and the, and, and the cruelty of it. You know, it, 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 was, it kind of sent shivers. And in a way, my interest in the Greeks and the Romans were a logical progression from that. Because if you think of the Romans, the Romans, the Roman Empire was, you know, it was an apex predator. It's kind of, you know, the great white shark. It's a Siberian tiger. It's a tyrannosaur of, 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 of the ancient world. And the kind of the savagery and the cruelty and the glamour of a Roman legion, I just found very, very kind of stirring. I, 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 but but the, that, but the that... gods, the Greek gods, again, it's kind of their beauty and their cruelty. I mean, they're unbelievably cruel. Very glamorous, very cruel. So they have a kind of rock star quality to them. And I just found them much, much more kind of glamorous, that, I suppose, than, 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 the, than the, uh, the monotheistic god. And when you, when you get older uh, and you become a parent or whatever, that whole idea of cruelty starts to take on a... Yeah. A, um... Yes, because, because as, a, as a child, um, I mean, if you think of Asterix, nobody ever dies in Asterix. This is the Gal- this is the Gallic Wars. Caesar <laughs> Caesar is supposed to have killed a million Gauls and to have enslaved another million Gauls. So this is not in any way cozy. But if you if you if your introduction to the Gallic Wars and to and to to the time of Caesar is Asterix, it's just you know legionaries hanging from branches with stars going around their head. It's all rather cozy and funny. Um, and I think it it kind of took me tight. Yeah, you know, becoming an adult actually you know. Yeah, having children. Cruelty's cruel. You know, I mean, cruelty. And then, and dis- then, the disgust at cruelty begins to strike you. Yes, it does. It does. And and um, I, I I made an, another film about Islam, which was about um, ISIS and um, uh, t- to what extent you could trace the origins of, of ISIS's ideology back to kind of Islamic ideas, foundational Islamic ideas. And as part of that, we we went to Sinjar, which was the the, the town where. The Yazidis had been based and where they were rounded up and, and some were killed, some were enslaved. Many of the men were crucified, their heads put on spikes. And we went to Sinjar um, at a time when ISIS were, were just a mile or so across no man's land from the blast walls, so within mortar range and everything. And um, and the rubble of the city was, you know, it was still there were still mines everywhere. And to walk to, to be there in, in 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 unbearable heat, about fifty degrees, the, the the smell still of bodies and of 
death in the air and to think that that people had been crucified here, that they'd been beheaded, it it gave me a visceral understanding of the horror of what imperialism and conquest would have meant in in the Roman world. And it it compounded really a sense that I'd had over the the 10 years or so where I'd been writing about classical civilization, writing about the age of Julius Caesar, writing about um, the age of the, the, the first Julia Claudian emperors and writing about the, the Spartans and the Athenians. And although, although the fascination endures, the, um, the, the, the wonder of, of, of their civilizations, um, the, the strangeness has become for me something unsettling. It, it it gives me nightmares. There's no glamour to the cruelty anymore. There is glamour, of course. There's glamour, but not um, to the cruelty. Yeah, there's glamour to the cruelty because oh, because because that, that's that, that's the awful thing. So so again, to go back to ISIS, when the beheading videos were released, for a week after they'd been released, the name of the victim would be one of the most googleable phrases across the world. People would be looking at this stuff, and the videos would be structured a bit like a computer game. They would draw you in. Uh, and there was one where a, a Jordanian pilot had been captured and was burnt alive. Mm. And it was situated to look like, you know, at the Colosseum. I'm sure it wasn't deliberate, but you realise that that appeal to the pleasure that people can take in watching other human beings suffering is not something that is ancient history at all. And the incredible degree of... Um, sophistication and stagecraft that went into, for instance, gladiatorial combats or the staging of executions or the beast hunts that were the math, you know, this is the, the, this was the entertainment. You can say, um, yeah, it's horrible. Nobody would have anything to do with it now. It's not true. People would absolutely have loads to do with it. People would absolutely watch it. People would get turned on by it. And, and, that's just... I think that to assume that we wouldn't no, just... downplays the potency of <clears throat> of of what Rome represented, because it, because so it was I've, not. It, it, so it, I can't I can't help but move from here to uh, Rome versus the crucified in terms of Christianity. Yeah. yeah. How, how does Christianity fit into the story for you? Well, I, as I said, I was raised a Christian. Um, both my mother and my godmother were very you know, crucial influences on me. I loved them deeply. I, I never had an issue with institutional religion. It was just that that I, it kind of faded a bit. Um, and I, because of the dinosaurs, I'd always had a slight problem <laughs> with with Adam and Eve. And I remember being in church and kind of, you know, whenever I was kind of feeling bored and looking, skimming through the New Testament, trying to find any references to centurions or to um, the Whore of Babylon or, you know, anything that would evoke Rome, just finding Rome kind of more glamorous, really. Mm. So I was always on the side of Pontius Pilate because, you mm. know, he was a Roman procurator. What's, mm. what's not to like? Mm. But of course, now I, I realise that the crucifixion is the most, the cross, what it represents, is the most astonishing symbol that humanity's ever really had. And the fact that it's become the most, probably the most single, most recognisable cultural symbol in human history is staggering because it is an emblem of torture and death and suffering. And I think that um, we in the West are so desensitised to it that we've lost the sense that this was an emblem of Roman power and the power that any governor had to impose death on those who stood up to Rome. And that power was the power to burn, to throw to the beasts, or to crucify. And what happened with the crucifixion is that people discovered that weakness could become a source of strength. And it was an epical discovery. And it, it, it changed the world. And the world that we live in, in that sense, is a deeply Christian one now, even so I don't need to tell you as a, um, a man of the cloth yourself. But what ultimately separates us from the world of, of, of classical Greece and Rome, therefore, I think, essentially is that, is it's everything that is summed up in the cross. Yeah. Is it the strength in weakness that 
victory is more complicated. Yeah, but it's also it's it, it, that the first it, will be. It's lower. also the strangeness of it. The the, the strangeness of the fact that um, people were, were 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 able to believe seemingly certainly by the time that Paul is writing, and that's a, a decade or so after the crucifixion is meant to have happened, when Paul writes about um, Jesus' crucifixion, he again, he's taking it for granted. It's not something he has to explain. All his letters are written to explain stuff. He's endlessly explaining stuff, but that's not something he has to explain. Nor does he have to explain the fact that in, in some kind of undefined way as yet... Jesus was in some sense part of the identity of the one creator God, the God of Israel. And so that's the strangeness of it. You know, I mean, it'd be strange enough if... if but if, the strangeness if, if, if is God, also what you're saying. If a God saying. was suffering, if yes. a God was suffering, but that God of all gods, I mean, it's passingly strange. I mean, what's supposed to look like defeat ends up being the great symbol of triumph yes. it's extraordinary yes and it's 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 very pointedly a triumph over caesar who is dv filius son of son of and 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 latin being what it was it could be son of you know a god son of the god son of god so it's it's <laughs> you know there's there's a really subversive quality and what, to and, and to what extent is is sort of western civilization and even now our sort of western cultural assumptions when we live in a sort of secular world everything to is what christian extent? everything is christian uh, it's a bit like the you know the goodness gracious me sketch where everything's indian <laughs> everything's christian basically and I, I would compare... Even in a secular world. Even well, in even a... A sec secular is a massively Christian idea. The cyclum, you know, it's, it's, it's a concept in Augustine. It's, it's, it, it means the span of life, the span of hu living human memory. So, you know, 80 years, 100 years. Um, and it's counterpointed to, um, to, to the celestial, to the heavenly, to the eternal. So the dimension of the cyclum, this idea of there being a dimension of the, the holy the divine and and the earthly, the secular, is inc becomes incredibly important. And what happens very distinctively in um, in, in in Western history, so in 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 the, the the sphere of Christendom that comes to acknowledge in the Middle Ages the primacy of the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, is that that idea of the secular gets weaponized by radicals who want to. Um, take the, the fundamental Christian idea of baptism, of sin being washed away and of being born again, of being born again to a new life, and they want to politicise it. And what happens in the 11th century is that these radicals who essentially are inventing the notion of political revolution, the notion of a, a, you know, a radical transformation in the way that politics is ordered, they seize control of the bishopric of Rome and they turn it into what we would now recognise as the papacy. And by doing that... They pull for themselves powers that previously had been the property of emperors and kings. And it's a convulsive, violent process, most famously represented in England by Henry II and the murder of, of Thomas Becket. But um, the, the, the primal example is where the German emperor, Henry IV, is made to kneel in the snows before the castle of Canossa before receiving absolution from Gregory VII, the, the, the great pope who in a way is kind of emblematic figure of this process of revolution. And... It sets in train processes that we will recognise in subsequent revolutions. So it, it, it unleashes a very, very kind of um, convulsive understanding of sacral violence, which in the 11th century, of course, takes the form of, of crusade against Muslims, yes, but also um, against Jews and against people who very radically get cast as heretics. It, it, it introduces um, notions of human rights, which get enshrined in, in canon law. And it unleashes the, the, the idea that um, reformatio, reform, is an ongoing process. That, 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 in a sense, law and society should be something that, that is progressive. And this is an idea that kind of gradually, for many people, runs out of steam. That sense of, of, of the revolutionary calcifies and atrophies. And that then generates another convulsion in the form of what we would call the Reformation, Reformation. so Protestantism. And then again in the 18th century, out of those same traditions, you get what we might call the Enlightenment with the French Revolution and so on. And you can see the kind of the, 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 the primal revolution in the 11th century is replicated in kind of spasms, reverberations, aftershocks that keep going through. And so in that sense, the idea of the secular is, 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 is 
highly Christian. I mean, it would, it would not, we would not have it without Augustine and Gregory the Seventh. Um, and the way I think of of kind of Christendom now is that it's like, um, you know, a great cathedral where bits have collapsed, but the asbestos still is still there in the air. You're, you know, you stand in it, you can't help but breathe it in, even if you don't know that you're breathing it in. And I think there's very, very little aspect of Western civilization that has not been profoundly shaped by deeply Christian understandings. And one of the ways in which Christian, that Christian impact is evident is the fact that pe- so many people are reluctant to admit that that might be the case. Because what has happened is a classic Christian paradox in that Christi- Christianity has become the most kind of hegemonic belief system in the, in the whole of the world. And it's... Overseas, it's come to be associated with, with, with European and American imperialism. It's come to be associated with white identity. And, of course, people have absolutely been able to turn around and say, OK, well, you know, that's hegemonic. We don't want it. But their motive for doing that is a Christian one because they're kind of saying, you have the power. We're going to reject that power. And so, in a sense, the very rejection of Christianity expresses how deeply Christianity has saturated and influenced the way that people think. So this, uh, I, I'm interested to, to just to finish in a minute by by talking about how this story that you've told, which is fascinating, how this uh, has influenced you, just you, Tom Holland, not as a historian, but you, Tom Holland, as a person. Um, so you were scratching around in your Bible, uh, well, looking for the bits about the Romans and so forth. I think, I think, I think how it's affected me is that um, it, in a sense, it's, it's theologized a lot of the, the uncertainties and the ambivalences and the issues of identity that had been affecting me as they've been affecting, you know, millions and millions of other people, particularly over the, over the past 10 years. And so my, my, my growing interest in, in Christianity and in Christian identity and how that relates to the civilization that I live in has paralleled a kind of enormous process of convulsion and change in, in the West. And I think that, that questions about um, identity, about privilege, um, uh, about the relationship of hegemonic structures with those who are don't belong to it, all of these issues which are kind of fundamental to liberalism and to liberal identity, I now recognise essentially... As, as bearing a Christian form. And so when, when I think about these issues, I, re- I, I think that their derivation is from but I'm, Christian I tell you, ideas. I tell you what I'm asking you. So you, you give me an intellectual answer, which I quite like to, because <laughs> well, you're, you're an intellectual and that's why. But let me just ask you this. So I want to return back to Tom looking a bit sheepish, um, praying with... So with are you a, asking, do I believe that the Lord Jesus what, Christ raised from the what dead? I'm, now, what I'm asking you is... No, because that's an intellectual question. What I'm well, asking you... No, well, hang on. So let me ask you the question I want to ask you. The question I'm asking you is, um, if you go to church yeah. uh, and you kneel down, yeah. do you kneel down in the same sheepish manner that you knelt down in the desert? Uh, no, I don't. And I, 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 I have been going to church. Um... And I kneel down in 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 a spirit of 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 interest to find out <laughs> to find out whether I'm going to feel embarrassed or not, I whether see. anything is going to happen. I see. Um, and the st- that- I suppose the state of play is 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 that um, I, f- I I feel the pity and the power of of the Christian myth in a non intellectual way. So I, you said I applied in an intellectual way. I, I feel it, 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 it touches my heart. Emotionally, viscerally. It emotionally, viscerally touches me. And there are times where I feel, um, you know, this, this, this could be belief, that the flame of belief is guttering back into existence. And I feel excited. You know, I would love that to happen. And there are times where I genuinely feel it. And then it kind of, you know, I think about the Mesozoic or something. <laughs> and, and, and it gets blown out again. But... Is it what I, but what I, I suppose what I feel is that th- th- I am aware of the direction of travel. And I, I've been writing a book about this. You can probably tell the kind of... 
<laughs> my readiness to talk about it. And I'm kind of looking. So, so I've I've read a lot of of um, 17th century literature, P- Pilgrim's Progress being the paradigmatic one of of the kind of Protestant idea of grace of 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 people who are on a journey looking for grace reaching out and I suppose I feel like that I you know like Christian in the Pilgrim's Progress I still have the burden on my back but I feel I'm traveling Tom Holland thank you very much indeed (laughs) that's wonderful thank you for listening to this episode of Confessions with me Giles Fraser if you're enjoying the podcast please do rate and review it and do subscribe wherever you get your podcasts I'll be joined by another guest next week for another episode of Soul Bearing and I do hope you'll tune in then. And do check out the website, unheard.com.